All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the New Ground Life and Leadership podcast. Today, I am thrilled to be joined by the amazing, the incredible Mrs. <laughs> Elizabeth Holden. Um, I do. <laughs> so, does anybody ever call you Elizabeth? Uh, no, my parents. <laughs> <laughs> okay so Liz it is originally from Seaford she's a blessed woman indeed in East Sussex uh, you've lived in Sidcup for 43 years um, where you have helped Dave in planting and establishing and growing new community church uh, whilst also at various points working as a nurse in the community Liz has four adult children and 13 grandchildren um, we, I discovered earlier, although in those grandchildren, the girls outnumber the boys seven to six. So go girls. Um, you're married to Dave Holden, who leads New Ground, and you, have, you yourself play a key role in both the growth and development of New Community Church and New Frontiers and New Ground. Um, I know that you're a friend to many and someone who has a passion for evangelism and enduring love for the church and has played a key role in mentoring and inspiring many women over the years so Liz it is a joy to have you on the podcast thanks for being here oh it's lovely to be here Jess thanks so Liz I'm looking forward to all that you know we're going to talk about together why don't you start perhaps for those who, who don't know some of your story um, tell us a little bit about what drew you to the Lord in the first place what hunger did you experience as someone coming to faith and uh, how did you try to fill it? And what did Jesus do in those early years of your life? Yeah, I think um, I was very privileged to have Christian parents who were very loving and guided. I was the youngest of four children. And in the early years, I actually remember very clearly as a seven year old going to, we used to go to scripture union classes on a Sunday afternoon, which was led by a stone deaf single woman <laughs> who would preach the gospel and I got saved at one of those classes which just wow. goes to show that when a radical person even with impaired you know hearing um can preach the gospel powerfully and so I gave my life to the Lord as a seven-year-old and then when I was in my teens I really struggled as a Christian partly I think things going on in my life I uh, in my early years at school I was bullied by a teacher which caused quite a detrimental effect on my um, confidence and then in my teens I was actually sexually abused by uh, someone a relative and I think that that so undermines your confidence and I think it caused in me a bit of rebellion <laughs> against God and then when I was 18 and I went to London to study nursing, adult nursing, I just, it was like I closed the door on my face and I thought I'm going to have a good time. So for about seven years, um, I lived in the world and to the max, you know, I was a bit of a party animal and it was during the early 70s where all my friends all my university friends and students, everyone was experimenting with so-called free love and freedom of expression and very hedonistic, I would say, lifestyle, but also um, a searching mentality. Everyone was searching for something, which was really interesting. And as a Christian, uh, having that heritage in my background, I started searching reading books on Eastern philosophy and tampering a little bit with drugs and stuff. But I think when I hit the end of my nursing and I went um, on a sort of hitchhike round Europe, which involved lots of <laughs> crazy adventures, I think I ended up just I guess a bit damaged and not facing up to certain issues in my life. And I spent a period of about two years on a Greek island. And, you know, I had lots of friends who would come and visit and so-called idyllic lifestyle. But underneath, I think I was getting quite depressed and not facing up to damages in my life and purpose. So I was definitely starting to question, what is my purpose? Why am I just living for the now? 
probably for the approval and acceptance of others. And literally, I think God started to work on me. I remember being on a beach with a crowd of friends, left them in the night, went up on a cliff and watched the sunrise and the fishermen coming out to gather their nets. And I just got this sense that God's creation is not ruined, it's beautiful. And there was a bit like a tug on my heart. So I packed up, I made <laughs> this big decision. I, I packed up, left the island, finished a relationship, didn't quite know why, came back, uh, got a job locally, because I stayed at my parents' home for a while. Um, I think I was, a, I got a job as an industrial nurse at the Bird's Eye factory in Eastbourne. <laughs> <laughs> and used to do night duty um, but in the mornings I would walk a friend's dog across the downs at Seaford Head and just cry and just ask big questions in my heart and then about uh, a few months later I just one day said to my mother oh I'm coming to church with you today she said oh that would be lovely. And amazingly, my parents never put pressure on me because by this time I was 24 and I'd lived away for a long time. And I walked into the church, which at the time was quite a new church led by someone called Terry Virgo. And I'd never been in a charismatic, worshipful setting really before. And I just, God spoke to me and it was so clear, someone actually had a prophetic word and it was like saying things that no one else would know. And it, it, I just felt like Jesus was saying, I actually have a calling on your life and it's time for you to come and follow me. Wow. I've got a purpose and a plan. And I just said, yep. <laughs> and totally in a moment, I was changed. The, that heaviness lifted. And I just knew I was the prodigal daughter, totally accepted, totally back in. And I remember walking home with my mum and she said, are you OK? I said, yeah, I've come back to God. She went, oh, good. <laughs> she said, do you, do you mind if I, if I tell the, the elders? She, I said, you can tell who you like. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so there began, you know, just a whole new direction of my life and I literally gave up everything else and came right back to God and was that your first Sunday at church then that experience happened um Is no that? I had a year before uh, my sister who was living in the Bahamas we were a family spread around the world I had a brother in Papua New Guinea and oh, wow. a sister in the Bahamas but um she was over visiting and she said to me, I was visiting and she said, why don't we go to church, you know, just to keep mum happy. So we went and um, what was funny was there was this young guy called Dave Holden preaching because he was being mentored by Terry. And we sat at the back, <laughs> Ruth said to me, my sister, oh, you should marry someone like that. And I said, ooh. He's good looking, but I'd never marry a religious creep. <laughs> Famous last words, right? Wow. <laughs> so God was on my case for a reason <laughs> and for someone else's reason, I think. <laughs> Gosh. And so, I mean, that, that experience you then describe a year later where you, you essentially saw, saw God at work in, in the church and it, it changed you. Um, Obviously, you, you described really uh, what sounds like a very dark, difficult experience in your teens. Uh, mm. For a lot of people, they then spend the rest of their life having to try to unpick and, and process and work through much of the trauma that experiences like that cause. Mm. Was that did you then have to learn to walk free, or was it was it such a dramatic transformation as cloud was lifted and everything was fine from then on? No, I think it was gradually coming to a revelation of, of what had happened because when you're young and something happens to you you don't tell anyone and you just shut down on it emotionally and I never told anybody 
And then when we, <laughs> funnily enough, I remember like in my relationship with Jesus, I genuinely felt his healing touch. It was like a man I can trust, mm. you know, a man who's so cleansed me. This sense of being clean was really wonderful. So it touched on those areas. And um, when it was interesting, it was when we were engaged, when we were getting married and we decided we're not going to hide anything from each other. And Dave was so in love with me and so accepting of me, knowing, you know, that I'd been backslidden for those years. I just thought, well, if I'm going to totally trust you, I have to tell you everything. So I told him everything about things in my past. And it was wonderful. It was like, it's no longer a secret. It has no power in that mm. sense. Mm. And sharing it with someone and praying together and the delight of still feeling loved <laughs> and accepted, in fact, treasured, I would say. Um, so he's been an incredible person who who's just shown the love of God to me and uh, yeah so in a strange way God can take real adversity in your life you know where you've been a victim or or whatever and actually turn it around for real good and, and has a positive outcome where actually you can then go on and really have empathy and love for others and know that God can set people free. Mm. And I think that Dave and I are very um, strong on the whole thing of living by the word of God and taking that responsibility to renew your mind. So, I mean, Dave wrote a book <laughs> from his own experience, but I think that daily applying and appropriating your identity in Christ, who you now are. It's, you, you're constantly going back to the gospel and your justification, and it gets right in here, and it does transform you. It sanctifies you as you walk forward, mm. but you, you don't forget your past, but it has no power over you, and actually it makes you mature because you, you so appreciate the power of, of of the cross of what it's done in your life yeah mm. i think you often get that don't you people who experience evil um there's a that you lose your naivety i mean not necessarily innocence but naivety that we think the world is good and everything's gonna be fine and then you encounter evil and i guess yeah. growing up in a christian home it must mm. have been difficult to try to square real evil with the kind of sentimental believism perhaps of a child growing up in a Christian home who's promised God will look after you and everything's going to be great and then evil happens uh, and I suppose was that part of what then caused you to have this exit these exodus years kind of wandering around searching for answers and truth somewhere else would you say or talk to me about that experience um yes yes I I mean I think you I forgot what I was going to say then <laughs> You know, you, you just, you don't realise how your response deep down is to something or the reason why you rebel against God. And it's often not till later on that you realise there are reasons. But also I think there is that sense of personal responsibility where I, I, I became very hedonistic. I just wanted to have a good time. And I think probably... Um, you know, my, my parents were older when they got married. So my parents were in their 40s when I was born. And I think I didn't get that guiding or, or education. I stumbled into adult, you know, into adolescence without any guidance. And I think that's why as a mother myself, I'm so keen that raising children having open conversations, guiding, you know, it's not down to teachers at school or your youth leaders to raise you. It's up to your parents giving you the instruction and the guidance. And I think I really missed out, although they were loving and kind. Once I got into my teenage years, I was definitely at sea. Mm. And, um, but of course, nowadays with, with 
these wonderful church life where there is much more family uh, focus and involvement it is different but mm. I think that's partly why I went off there was there was no guidance you know I mean I was funnily enough when I was 17 I got baptized and then there was a bit like this gap and that's when it all sort of went wrong um, I mean you know it's no one's fault but you can see the importance of discipling young people, just how important it is. Mm. Crucially, in those teenage years, you know, that they have mentors, that their parents, you know, don't just back off when they're teenagers, but step in and, you know. Yeah. yeah. Talk to us about, a bit as well about the, um, your experience of church, because, you know, obviously church changed a lot. Uh, probably in the years that you went away so just you, know, you growing up in perhaps a, a fairly traditional maybe conservative um from what i understand cold church experience pre-charismatic renewal and then to come back and see prophecy in action and the, the presence of the, of the spirit in meetings um mm. what was it about you know i guess you're you're dabbling in eastern philosophy um for a lot of people i think there's a a searching for spiritual experience that goes on and they they grow up and they think well the church isn't going to offer me spiritual experience that's going to offer me moral sermons and moral lessons and so they wander away um talk to me a bit about yeah your experience of church and how it changed to the point when you came back you realized oh there's power here there's there's experience to be had here and that might point to truth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think the so i came back to god and literally within two weeks I I met with one of the pastors and his wife and they were like taking me through a discipleship thing and I I said hang on so I know a lot of this stuff but th there's something missing what is it because being in a in in a context of worship where people seem to encounter God and I thought well, I want to. What is it? I'd never heard of the Holy Spirit, really. And so um, they explained <laughs> from Scripture the role of the Holy Spirit for a Christian. And it was just like, you know, it says in the Bible, the eyes of my heart were enlightened. I thought, that's what's been missing in my life. That was why I struggled. I had no power. I had no um person here you know so I said well pray for me I want him so um they they were so sweet they were so kind they um they laid hands on me they said Jesus you promised your spirit and I said yes I'm thirsty hurry up give it to me and they prayed for me to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and it was a dramatic experience I just just had that just sense of being overwhelmed by the love of God, the power of God, his acceptance, just subjectively knowing and just feeling full. And when I left them and I went back to where I was staying and, well, actually at that time it was my parents, and uh, I, I, I just went to bed, knelt by my bed, and I spoke in tongues all night. Hmm. In fact, Early in the morning, I woke up my, not my dad, my mother, and I said, listen to this. <laughs> I just spoke in tongues and she said, glory to God. <laughs> wow. Oh, dear. But it was such, um, I really changed as a person. So the shyness and, you know, particularly just in my personality but also from from being bullied mm -hmm. um, as a young child that shyness went my the freedom to witness I was suddenly witnessing to everyone all my old friends and everything putting them all off um, it, it was just incredible it was suddenly like this is how you live the Christian life he's the one who gives you and suddenly I started to have um prophecy and and I started to find I had discernment and it was it was thrilling and I thought this is 
what they, how the New Testament lived, you know, they moved in the power of the spirit and this is what we need today. And I think being in the church and getting teaching on the early church and how we're supposed to be and act and respond, it, it, was, it was a wonderful time. It was really wonderful. And learning about, it's not Sundays, but it's day by day, being in each other's homes, sharing life together. I mean, I, I'm passionate about discipleship. And I just think as soon as you become a Christian, mm. you're a discipler because you're being discipled and you can't not disciple other people. You know, you sometimes say people say, oh, you know, you have to become a leader before you can disciple people. You have to become more mature. No, you don't. <laughs> You've encountered Jesus so you can help other people too. And then the Holy Spirit helps you. So it was wonderful, I have to say. Wow. Yeah, there is that beautiful line, isn't there, that Peter says to the, the beggar at the uh, Solomon's colonnade, where he says, silver and gold I haven't got, but what I do have I give to you. And mm. that's where you realise that. And I think there, can, there is a bit of a danger with churches that are by and large led led by the paid individual and the paid individuals often they're released to study and read the word and then teach and so you can end up creating churches where it looks like being a christian means you need to know a lot of things you need to know and read lots of books and you need to be able to talk to people about lots of clever ideas whereas actually it's not it's about what i what i have i give to you which is jesus <laughs> like in the name of jesus get up and walk um and i know like from things that you said being spirit filled in everything you do is something that's a, a big passion of yours and you think needs to yeah. um we need to rely on that a lot more in church life um what what does that look like for you do you think to have churches that are full of the holy spirit where people are reliant on the holy spirit um to create environments where we're not we're not communicating Christianity as an intellectual thing where you just need to read and become academic, but actually the importance of the, the power of the Holy Spirit in everything we do. Um, perhaps just share with us what that might look like for you and why you think, why you're so passionate about that even to this day. Well, I think, you know, the, the charismatic movement was birthed by people being filled with the spirit and encountering the spirit in a, in a new way that had been, I guess, dormant. And, just get you get and the the joy of getting revelation from scripture in a new way because the holy spirit is revealing things to you and i think church leaders relying on the holy spirit you know so we're we always say don't we in in our churches we're word and spirit so they're not enemies they're friends and the two together produce that incredible growth in the life of the church you know because without the spirit the word can be dry mm. and with just the spirit you who knows <laughs> you can you can go off as a tangent you know so there's that harmony and i think also um it i think even in the last um two years you know which has been so tough for church leaders trying to lead people and care and shepherd people without that physical presence and without that joined together in worship settings and where there is that freedom to hear from God. I know you can do it online, but it's, it's very limited to some degree. Mm. Um, but, you know, church is organic, isn't it? it it's a people. It's not, um, it's not a method. It's not a business. It's not a building. It's the people of God mm. and it's the life of the spirit in the people of God where everyone and it's lovely that, you know, in Joel about your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men will dream visions, you know, and your spirit will be poured out on all flesh. It's like everyone has a part to play. And I think leaders who take the initiative to raise up people so that they everyone has a part to play because we're a people of the spirit. And I think that's much more a style that is what's important in local church life. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's so helpful. So inspiring. Such a great reminder. Um, <laughs> so you talked a bit about prophecy. As, uh, I, know, I know I've been in settings as well where you prophesied. Is that something that is, that, is that, would you say that's one of the kind of a, a 
key gift that God's given you to be able to prophesy? And then maybe you could talk to us about how you prophesy and how to encourage people to start prophesying and why we think prophecy is a gift that's worth pursuing. Why does Paul say eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy? What are your reflections on some of that? Well, I think, um, you know, building church is, 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 can be hard work because <laughs> people are people <laughs> and uh, church would be great without the people, <laughs> I've heard Dave say, <laughs> but that's, that's the way Jesus is um, spreading his kingdom. It's through the people of God. It's through the church. It's his, it's his, it's his plan A. He hasn't got yeah. a plan B <laughs> and it's through his, his people and um and i think the 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 danger can be you know as, as churches grow and get larger and how we function is we can dial down on spiritual gifts but they they are a precious commodity that that jesus has given to his church mm. so that the activity of the spirit can happen and you know as paul as you said paul said it's earnestly desire but especially that you prophesy. And I think, you know, when you're planning what you're going to do next with your church or, you know, how we're going to move forward, I think, well, particularly New Frontiers churches were birthed in, or we've heard from God often through a prophetic word, and that's shaped the direction of where we'll go now, which is incredible, isn't it? Because you yeah. feel that confidence, oh, God's spoken. And, you know, when you prophesy, it's not just that you, you know, everyone says, oh, yes, it says way prophecy, you know, mm. let two or three weigh and see, oh, is this God? You know, so it's not just done randomly. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I just know from over the years in, in the New Frontiers world and churches that, you know, there's sometimes a prophetic word of come and it's meant a uh, complete change of direction or you know it, and it it so furthers the purposes of God when we listen to what you know he's saying and allow that wonderful gift to be operating and then of course in the local church you know prophecy it builds up the body of Christ it's such an encouragement you know and you know, that's when you weigh prophecy. Does it align with the word of God? Is it encouraging? Yes. So, you know, and it's incredible how it can um, just really, really help. And I know that sometimes people think it's a gift out there that's unattainable. But actually, if you're a person of the word, if you're filled with the spirit, if you're seeking God and desiring, you know, it says hunger after these things. I know that I personally, when I don't, pray about it or when I don't seek God you know for prophecy or a spiritual gift I can easily almost like forget mm. that it's there because it you know Paul says to Timothy stir up the gift that you know is in you that was late mm. you were laid hands on for and I know that yeah I guess to some degree I, I might have a gift of prophecy but unless I activate it uh, you know you're not a zombie Christian <laughs> it's up to you to walk with the spirit and to edify yourself that's why I would say speaking in tongues is such an important part of my Christian life because I can get dry and I do go through dry seasons but I intentionally walk with God and speak in tongues and edify build myself up and ask the Holy Spirit will you come and speak to me I know that you know, sometimes in the week I'll be reading the word and I'll think, wow, that's interesting. And then I'll think, is that a prophetic word? Are you, you know, ask the Holy Spirit, are you showing me something that's for the body of Christ? Is it something, mm. you know, and then you, you know, you treasure these things in your heart. And then when you maybe are there on a Sunday morning or just before, and I would just say, Lord, have you got something for me? to build up the body of Christ? Is there something I can bring? Almost like prepare yourself to contribute. Don't just go to receive, <laughs> um, you know, and then you can even be there and, in a, and just sense in the worship and the Holy Spirit prompting you saying, yes. And even, yeah, this even ties in with a theme of what seems to be coming across. It's not mm. just 
random out there somewhere. And I think sometimes we, we need to go back to developing that gift because I think sometimes you prophesy in part and you, and like even in, you know, like your, your midweek community, it's a good place to, in a sense to experiment with hearing from God and to, because you learn by practice. Mm. I mean, it's not just a chemical formula. You learn by trial and error and, and walking with God, reading his word. But, yeah. Um, yeah, and I know that, you know, there's been times when it's just been a gentle word of encouragement or other times it's been something that's been very directional for, um, for us. I remember when um, Dave and I wondered about whether we should go and spend a period of time in South Africa and we were praying about it and, and I just really felt this prophetic urge that I could see where we should go and and base ourselves and it was very you know obvious and direct and that's what helped us make the decision as to where and when and everything so yeah it's mm. it's an incredibly helpful gift <laughs> and, and and it, God, sorry. sorry i was going to say one of the things that seems to be key you repeated the phrase a couple of times about building the church encouraging people there needs to be uh, a desire to actually encourage and help and strengthen and love other people you know it's not it, and that's where we think to, to to build the church requires a desire to do something to help others so there requires a you have to engage that part of it that says i want to love someone which isn't passive so the move in the move from passive to active isn't just let's do something dramatic in God today. Let's let's see some signs and wonders. The, the motive for signs and wonders, the motive of prophecy, it seems, comes out of the desire to love another person, to strengthen another person, to build up a church. And you know, you have been um, in the in the same local church now for forty three years. We said at the start, um, helping to establish and strengthen and grow that church along with Dave. And when you talk about the church, you still have a a smile and a delight um you, you know you, there seems to still be an enthusiasm for the local church and yet it was probably i'm assuming over 43 years you'll have no doubt walked through patches where you thought oh this is really hard these people are really mean or this hasn't been enjoyable so where does that love for the church come from and how have you managed to sustain that love for the church to even <laughs> want to prophesy to the church and strengthen the church do you know what i mean yeah. i mean i think it's walking with people not on your own I know that in leadership Dave and I have always been so strong on working in team I mean just to say we you know Dave doesn't lead the church anymore it's all been handed over but over the years just always always being strong on team and of course we travel to other churches and stuff and you know, one of our main things is to make sure that people are not in isolation, that they're not going it alone. Because, you know, back in the day, the pastor was the one who did everything and almost was encouraged not to mix with his congregation. <laughs> but the joy of being side by side with people through the challenges that you face in leadership, um, it makes all the difference. And so when you're disappointed or you've been hurt or you've been completely misunderstood, you know, to, of course, come to God and lay it there, but also to share it with others. I know, I remember, I mean, it's great being married, <laughs> but the number of times I think we've, you know, gone to bed and, you know, we're lying down and Dave says, oh, I don't know. I can't sleep because he's worried about something, you know, and he feels things deeply. And and I just he, get, he gets annoyed, but he appreciates it. I say to him, hang on. Who, who said he would build his church? Hmm. Jesus. <laughs> You're not building the church. Jesus is building the church. But it's just that 
it's Jesus's love is his church and it sounds very simple I am so in love with Jesus I'm in love with what he's in love with and then you don't get disappointed because it's his problem <laughs> not mine mm. <laughs> and I think the depth of my relationship walking with Jesus he really is the number one in my life and even when I'm disappointed you know with church leadership or when things go wrong and it's it's a struggle because you're you're thinking how will this get resolved to know that it, it is in the best hands mm. <laughs> you know he, he's the one he, and he's the one who, who who will carry the burden and you do have to learn to you know cast all your cares upon me you know that famous those famous verses which books have been written about but his burden is easy and it is light mm. but not when you carry it on your own and i think shepherds need to make sure they're doing that you know in carrying the cares of the church they're just under shepherds they're not fully responsible mm. you know they are before god of course but he's the ultimate shepherd i mean there's some great i, I love uh, Jen Wilkins book none like him because she goes through all the attributes of God and it puts you in your place you know he's the one who's limitless he's the one who's infinite he's the one who's omnipresent when you're not mm. <laughs> you know he's, he's all these things so you you can have confidence in him for his church and you know Dave and I when we met part of the attraction to each other wasn't just we fancied each other but we had such a passion for the church because as it was before and so you know sort of I guess traditional but legalistic but church is full of grace and truth and seeing lives change there's, there's nothing else like it and I think the gospel being presented often is a big key as well that this is why we're here <laughs> to stop people going to hell to to experience the grace of god and i think being mission focused as a church you know it's always in your mind we're here for the lost we're not here for ourselves we're here to reach people for jesus and living with knowing how he's changed my life I would say on a daily basis that gratitude and that desire for wanting more people more people to come mm. and I think living in um, you know the world that Dave and I live in in that we're based in our local church still although we're not in that sense responsible for anything but we're part of this wonderful body but we do have group of friends people in our local community that we spend time with and when you're with people and they invite their friends and they experience the grace of God you're suddenly back in Acts 2 and you think yeah this is why we're here <laughs> this is what it's about it's simple and I think we sometimes get very complicated Wow, oh, I loved so much of what you just said. It's so inspiring and helpful. I love that line. I love Jesus, and so I love what Jesus loves. Uh, and that's pretty, also as well, you, your emphasis. You said at the beginning, and we talked about this before. You don't love the church per se, but people as well. It's it's about it's not this nameless kind of no. institution called the church, but it's individual people. I was talking to someone the other day who quoted Bonhoeffer, who said, um, "You know, it, it, people who." can end up loving their vision of church more than the actual church in front of them we get annoyed with the, the church we're part of because we think oh don't you know you're ruining the vision of church that i've got <laughs> but to actually I love mean, the I, people yeah i i just remembered um over these you know years we've sent people you know because they've gone to another country or they've gone to plant a church and i think new community has been very good at that raising up leaders and sending them and Dave would say to me, Liz, you're crying again. And I said, they're my friends and they're going and I'm sobbing. Mm. <laughs> and I said, it's because it's people and I, I'm just so deeply love these people and have cared for them. 
and we're sending them, but of course it's with tears because this is who we are. We're, we're joined in love. We really are. Oh, and there's, and it, there's, there's nowhere else like it. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I often think it's, we, we love one another, but we really love one another because we both have a shared love of this saviour who has mm. changed us so much. So actually that's what unites the church, isn't that we all like golf, or we all like football, or we all like whatever, we all like coffee. Um, but it's actually, we all love Jesus and that's our unity, isn't it? It comes, it stems from, from that. So how do you, how do you maintain a, a love for Jesus? Let's ask that first. I love asking this question about just practically in your life, um, through the undulations of ministry and disappointments and heartbreaks, what are some of the ways that you maintain a passion for the Lord? Uh, singing <laughs> I think just having I mean Dave's very we're very different so he's more strategic method disciplined I'm more of a free spirit go with the flow <laughs> spontaneous and we've had to learn to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think we rubbed off on each other to some degree he doesn't any longer write a list when we go on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in terms of, um, he's been such an example to me of having a form of discipline in your life where your devotion to Jesus is, you make a plan. You don't just, I mean, you enjoy Jesus every day, but you do have disciplines, spiritual disciplines in your life. And I think for me, at this stage in my life, um, it was different when we had four rowdy children, of course, and it was a bit of grab it while you can. And I, I must admit, Dave would sometimes, you know, give me space to get away. But um, I think for me, every morning I'm up early. I am an early riser on the whole. And the quietness to just meditate on my love for God, to worship, to speak in tongues. To, to listen to hear what he wants to say to me because I just find if you give God time he will speak to you and he will <laughs> challenge me on attitudes and, and usually every day there's something to ask for forgiveness for it's just like a fresh start every day a fresh appreciation it's not difficult I know and yeah sometimes it's a struggle because I'm exhausted or I've got a headache or mm for whatever reason or I've been really hurt by something or but you you just don't stop you you know you, you I know myself I'm not I'm not fooled I know I, I can slip discipline I know I can um I can back off I can get dry so I I activate that side of my life and and it is a delight I do have to say and I think one of my probably one of my in, most enjoyable ways is to walk so at the back of our house there's a big field and I, I love to walk and pray and I would say what I try and do is I don't know once a month is, is to get out and just be alone for a part of the day and uh, yeah and uh, and just reading the Bible for itself. <laughs> I mean, I do read a lot of Christian books and I listen to stuff, but just sitting, meditating day by day on just a few verses, just letting them sink in, understand them, ask God to show me. I think so often if we just rely on the Bible in one year or something, mm -hmm. you're always rushing through something and I think you know I think I've learned over the years that dwelling in the word of God and meditating on it really helps mm -hmm. to deepen deepen your relationship with God so there's that's, probably a lot of other things but you know no that's great and uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that Dave doesn't make a list when he goes on holiday anymore no, <laughs> that, that's a sign of a healthy marriage right there <laughs> that must have been fun to holiday with all the continuity gone. Let's make a list. <laughs> actually, the part is we did do a lot of things, and the kids did actually love it. 
Though when they became teenagers, it was a bit more, oh, do we have to? But you, know. you can't say that because you'll start making lists again, Liz. If you start saying it, actually, there's good in it. But uh, Liz, what I, I, I have become a list person. Oh, yeah. They really impress with me. He goes, oh, you're writing a list. Uh, <laughs> hey, look um, at that. There's a healthy marriage. We rub off on each other. There we go. Uh, well, Liz, one of the things I know you're also really passionate about is is seeing women become confident, free in their position in Christ to be used by God in the local church, fulfilling their calling and using their gifts. Um, and you ran the, the Fearless Women's Conference just before the world turned upside down with COVID. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe you can, to, to, maybe hot off the press, we can get an inside story about whether or not there's going to be a future Fearless Conference for women. But um, talk to us a bit about, you know, your experience of being a woman in ministry and leadership in New Frontiers over the years and how you've been able to help mentor and encourage other women. Um, and one of the things I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on as well, this is, I appreciate it's a big open-ended question, so you can just go wherever you want, but there, there was and there is perhaps a caricature of the complementarity of New Frontiers in the early days, um, the recovery of um, male eldership, and often the caricature was that women weren't released in leadership very much in churches. Um, I'd love to hear some of your experience and thoughts on that. Mm. I think you have to really know what the word of God says and what you believe. And yes, of course, you listen to good teaching, but you have to come to your own conclusions. And I think I right from the early days from studying scripture i was extremely comfortable with the fact on the whole thing of eldership being just a few men but just a few who shepherd the flock who are accountable before god who have the the authority to lead their church and that that final responsibility and then for the rest of it in terms of leadership it, it's up for grabs for men and women <laughs> and it's liberating and I would say I felt very secure in my own calling in God and in raising up other women to just have the freedom to take up all sorts of initiatives and responsibilities. I think in the early days you know Dave would say to me I you know, it'd be really good if you gathered people and discipled them and this. And I was basically like a young Christian. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> but I think I, I really learnt about the grace of God. It's not, you know, being suddenly this amazing pastor or, you know, someone who suddenly found herself in leadership. I'm Liz Holden. I'm a person. I've got my identity in Christ. I've had an amazing journey. And if I've got something to share with others, then I'll do that. And then you feel comfortable with yourself. And, you know, to, to gather women, to share lives together. Yes, of course, to teach and instruct and to build their confidence through the word of God. I mean, I love doing things like that. And I think also, with individuals God sometimes brings people into your life doesn't he that you specifically you know discipleship isn't a lifelong commitment it's people come and go from your life and over the years that's what it's been like often you know with individuals women sometimes in other parts of the world you know they just feel drawn to me and I'm drawn to them and we have this relationship and this accountability and encouragement together so it's just been I guess organic I'm not a great you know just say method person but I just think knowing that if I can love other women and raise them up I'm I just love to do that absolutely love to do it and I think when you think about it women are usually the higher percentage in in churches women I think are more savvy and are more open to the gospel and not so um i don't know not so big about themselves so they're open to god 
I think men have a big problem with pride <laughs> often. And uh, I just think the gospel has so liberated women to, to be themselves and to pursue the things in God. And I love to encourage that in women. And women love to be together. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> there is a, we're social people. And when, you, when I put on the Fearless Conference two years ago, the, the buy-in was terrific. There is this joy, sisters in Christ, being together, you know, stirring one another up to be godly, to be courageous, to be holy and to serve God. And to women are amazing. So many women take the initiative for social action for all sorts of things. I mean, you look amongst new ground churches and see what women are doing. It is incredible. And they need to be encouraged more. Um, and I think, you know, like you said, over the years, I think we've learned that women have needed to be encouraged. It, it's had to be intentional. You know, it's like with diversity, you don't just say, oh yes, we believe in diversity unless you're doing something about it. Mm. And I know that, um, you know, in our church, James Silly has been so, so intentional about raising up women in leadership, raising up, you know, the whole diversity issue. Y you have to act upon it. You don't just think, I believe this, unless you're doing something about it. So the joy of discovering women with their gifts and, and saying yes, <laughs> mm. you know, giving them the freedom to, to pursue their calling. Mm. This, I think we're, we're in a much better place than we were. Yeah. And we've still got a long way to go. <laughs> and so what do, you, what do you think are some of the challenges um, that women are facing today in church and leadership that may be different from, um, say, 30 years ago or maybe they're the same you know you said we've got a long way to go we've we've we've, we've recovered some of the the importance of honoring and celebrating the gift and role of women in leadership in church um you don't see so i guess a couple of thoughts what are your reflections on what you might see in society generally with attitudes either from women or about women um but then also do you do you your you don't see the male only eldership thing as being a prohibitor to women's flourishing in church. I'd like to hear just your, more of your thoughts on that. Well, so I know what I believe, but then when it comes to practice, I, I, it's, it's brilliant. So I think for women to feel secure that there are people leading this church and they are accountable before God. And I have the freedom to pursue my calling in God. And to be honest, being married to an elder all these years and to, to see that responsibility and carrying that authority, it is, it's not taken lightly. It really isn't. And, and I think just going to scripture, you know, the creational thing in society today is that men and women aren't different. So basically you can be who you want to be. And this is what society has created. And I think, you know, in the beginning, God created male and female he created them and that is the beautiful delight is that we are different and <laughs> yes we're all equal in the sight in the sight of God and th the celebration of those differences and those roles I think is a beautiful thing and I know that for myself and for Dave I would say as we're older now playing the part of a father and mother to people means yeah we have authority we have wisdom from God but it's all about being in a family and and being real people and caring and loving people and mentoring people 
and in our who we are, me as a woman, him as a man. There's, there's no difference in terms of the freedom that we feel to be those people. So, mm. no, that's, that's that's really helpful. Um, what else was I going to say? Sorry, my my brain just dried up just as. <laughs> um, I can't argue a theological case because I'm not a deep theologian, but I know what I believe and I know what works. <laughs> yeah, and I think what I find what's what's interesting, Liz. I mean, you, as you shared at the start, you experienced abuse by a man as a, I presume, as a man, as a teenager, and yet you 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 still find yourself happy to not write off men and male eldership. Is that in part because? Oh, not in part. In, is that because of what you experienced in the, the elders in the early days of your coming back to the Lord and in your example of Dave as a husband? In my experience, it seems that, um, and this is only experience and a caricature and a stereotype, so it's going to be full, but in my experience, it seems that when, when one sex has a negative or evil experience of a, the opposite sex, it can be very easy to write off and say all men are or all women are, and therefore a kind of a... a a bit of resistance to the idea of mutual submission or of appreciation or I don't know if I'm making myself clear I'd just like to hear how you managed to process what you went through and didn't then kind of there wasn't a root of rebellion towards men as a result of the evil that you experienced that's what I suppose I'm curious about um, and you know I may well cut this out because it might not be a good question or whatever but I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that. I think it's interesting, isn't it? I've not really thought about that. But when the gospel invaded my life as a young adult, I think I was, what, 24, it so changed me, you know, knowing that you're right with God, knowing your sins are forgiven, knowing that Jesus has forgiven you. I remember coming to a place where, I hadn't thought about it, but I felt God say, so you need to forgive what's happened to you. And I didn't find it difficult because I was in that place of understanding, you know, mm. the gospel and what it means. So I think that really helped making that choice to forgive. Um, and I honestly have never had an issue with men because I, I understand, if you like, the male psyche and how it can go wrong. So, but it's never affected me in that way in terms of, if, if anything, it's given me a real sensitivity when there's something wrong. If I see a guy that's being too friendly with one of our young women, in the past, I have gone and spoken <laughs> and said that that's inappropriate. So I'm not nervous or fearful or reacting. I'm just wanting to be godly and wanting others to be pure, you know, rub, treat sisters with all purity. It's very important in the Christian life that we, that I, and I think I, I've learned to help women to you know, scripture talks very clearly about, you know, don't don't present yourself in a sexual way. Yes, I, I'm I love fashion and everything, but you know, don't don't put guys in that position where they're, you know, because I think women say, well, men shouldn't do that. But I think, you know, if you're showing a big cleavage, you're <laughs> don't invite temptation, but you know, it's just that whole balance of dignity as a woman of God that I try to teach others and then with men to help them learn to treat sisters with all purity so if anything it has a positive outcome that um, I would say and I think this I just feel particularly with men they're my brothers mm. you know and there is that brotherly affection 
So like with the guys in our church here, they're my brothers. There's, you know, there's trust. There's, it's not, if anything, it's become an advantage to me, the thing I've experienced in the past. It's really, you know, you mature, you understand, and you, you are able to help others. And I think also being able to help women themselves who've had their own experiences has, has been quite a big part of my life because you, you have that understanding, which is just great. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Amazing to hear how the gospel is just completely transformed evil into something that's been useful as a, as a source of good and growth for you. Um, yeah. Liz, what, you're gone. That's what sanctification does, doesn't it? You're justified, so you take that into your sanctification walk. You know, you change in how you view people and society and, and how to manage it and how to help others. It's just great. Wow, I love your vision of church as family. Like you're absolutely right. It was the, the Apostle Paul says about relating to one another in absolute purity. There's a mm. honor and respect. And I, I think part of the challenge facing the, the church as society, the church as a part of society, is because in society increasingly battle lines are drawn rather than purity, love, respect, honor. It's it's a polarizing group identification, you know, saying men are, women are, black people are, white people are. There's just a is a dangerous identity politics that goes on um and actually to be at a church that says no we're a, we're a family that relates to one another in all purity with honor and respect but that also doesn't mean we put up with um inappropriate behavior we're brothers enough to go up and call out someone's sin and when they're getting too close to the line we challenge that we're not passive as a family we're not just you know giving tipping our hat to the idea of family and saying oh it's a lovely word so we'll use it like everyone else does and we're actually going to be a family that means challenging that means how, having those kind of relationships that are really important that is very inspiring and um yeah and beautiful. also that you know my passion for the holy spirit and spiritual gifts is that there is a spirit of discernment and sometimes you can discern um a sin or or have a word of knowledge and that can really um, be amazing because it can give someone an opportunity to change. You know, it's yeah. like they've been found out <laughs> and it's God's grace. It's always mm -hmm. God's grace, you know, to, to bring redemption and to change things for the good. Mm, yeah, Paul says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. His mm -hmm. kindness doesn't put up with our sin. It leads us to repent, doesn't it? Um, so, Liz, will there be another fearless conference in the future? That's the question everyone's asking. Well, I met with Dave and Dale and Dave's PA Elizabeth yesterday, and I presented my case for a fearless conference next year. I placed my bid and I won. Hey! <laughs> and... Uh, probably uh sometime later in june next year wow that's great and i'm sure if it's anything like the last one it will be signed up within the first 48 hours or something silly like that is that what happened wasn't it yeah. it was yeah i i i did promote it well <laughs> and let's hope there aren't any major global catastrophes happening around the same time the conference goes on <laughs> oh dear that was that was quite an event i tell you yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, Liz, is, um, before we go, is there anything else that you think is on your heart or mind that you'd love to just share before we finish? Um, no, I, it's been a real privilege to talk. And um, I just love the family of God. And I'm just so grateful to be a part of it all these years mm -hmm. and to know that Jesus is building his church and he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, Liz, we love you. And we're so grateful for all that you've sown into people's lives over the years. People who may not know you up close and personal, but have been blessed and influenced by you over the years. So thank you so much for your amazing example of godliness and love for Jesus. It means so much. Thanks.